Hello and welcome back to the course Physics 141 Classical Electromagnetism 1. Before we start our today's lesson, let's first review some of the concepts that we have discussed in the previous lesson. So, in the previous lesson, we mainly discussed about Coulomb's law for discrete charge distribution. So, this is the point uh, electric field of point charge. Uh, which is also known as the Coulomb's law and where our separation distance vector R here is just given by uh, R minus uh, R minus R prime. R here is our field point position vector. R prime is our source point position vector. So for this uh, lesson we will continue with Coulomb's law for continuous charge uh, distribution. So let's now start. So for continuous charge distribution, the total electric field due to the distribution will be an integral. So instead of summing for discrete, the discrete case for the continuous case, we now integrate. So integrate all of the differential electric fields due to all of the differential charge elements so there will be three main uh, or types of charge distribution we have a line charge distribution where all of your uh, charges are along a single line then we also have a surface charge distribution where in your charges are distributed in a two-dimensional surface and of course, lastly, we have volume charge distribution where your uh, charges are now distribu distributed within a volume, say, V. So if you have a line charge distribution, then the description of the distribution can be given by lambda, which is what we call the linear charge density. Now, this is basically charge per unit length, so dq over dl differential charge over differential length in the event that your uh, linear charge density is constant then it's also equal to the total charge over the total length for surface charge distribution your charge density will be a surface charge density sigma charge per unit area again if your sigma is uniform or constant then it's just equal to the total charge over the total area. And for volume charge distribution, you have rho for volume charge density and it's charge per unit volume. And of course, again, if it, if it is constant or uniform, then it's just equal to the total charge over the total volume. So you will see here from the linear charge density equation that dq is just equal to lambda DL. Similarly, for a surface charge distribution, dQ is sigma dA. And for a volume charge distribution, the differential charge is rho dV. So this is actually our equation, our Coulomb's law equation for continuous charge distribution. You actually just need to replace, replace your differential charge dQ with any of these three depending on the problem. So if the problem is a surface charge distribution, you need to replace dq here in the integral by sigma dA and so on. So before we have an example, let's review some of the coordinate systems. So we have three types of uh, coordinate systems. Uh, the Cartesian x, y, z. If you rotate this Cartesian coordinate system about the z-axis at, at an angle phi, you will get the cylindrical coordinate system s phi z s is what we call the two-dimensional radius phi is what we call the azimuthal angle and it ranges from 0 to 360 degrees or 2 pi and of course z is the z axis so from cylindrical coordinates if you rotate this coordinate system ab uh, about about the phi axis so z now will be the z axis will now be rotated at an angle phi then it now becomes the r 
axis and this is now the spherical coordinate system so r theta phi so r is now the three dimensional radius theta is what we call the polar angle so it starts from the positive say z axis towards the negative z axis so from the north pole to the south pole so the value of theta here will just be from 0 to 180 degrees or from 0 to pi so these are the differential lengths if you have a Cart cartesian coordinate system so dx dy dz so these are the direction so if you have a differential length vector so x hat y hat z hat if you have uh, a differential area then there's three possible areas for Cartesian coordinate systems. If you are integrating or working in the xy plane, then your differential area is dx dy, and the direction of that is z hat. Take note that the direction of the area vector is always perpendicular to the surface. So if your surface is the xy plane, then the perpendicular direction to that is the z axis or the z sorry the z direction. So for dy dz x hat, for dz dx y hat. For the differential volume, unlike the length and differential areas, it's not it, it cannot be a vector because volume is a scalar quantity. So in general, to find the differential volume, you just multiply the three differential lengths. In this case, our differential lengths are dx, dy, and dz. So the differential volume will be dx dy dz. In cylindrical coordinates, these are the differential lengths. So if your length or line is pointing in the s hat direction, then your differential length is ds. If it's pointing in the phi hat direction, it's sd phi and it's for the z hat dz. Uh, for the differential area in cylindrical coordinates, you have two areas. So take note that a cylinder, if you have a cylinder, There are two areas actually for a cylinder. The top and bottom whose area is just pi r squared and the side or the body of cylinder whose area is just uh, pi r squared L. So for the top and the bottom areas the direction of the area vector is along the z axis for the areas of the body of the cylinder or yeah of the body of the cylinder the direction of the area vector here is along the s hat direction so the two dimensional radius it's radially outward so this is the s hat uh, direction so the first uh, differential area here is the area of a circle the top and the bottom of the cylinder and the second differential area here SD phi DZ is the body of the cylinder so if you integrate this differential area you will get pi r squared so S is evaluated from 0 to R the radius of the cylinder and phi is evaluated from 0 to 2 pi so for the body of the cylinder, similarly, uh, phi is from 0 to 2 pi and z is from 0 to L, the length of the cylinder. So in this case, this is the length of the cylinder and this is the radius of the cylinder. So you will get pi r squared L if you integrate this differential area. So for the differential volume of course it's a scalar quantity it's just a multiplication or the product of the three differential length ds sd phi and dz for spherical coordinates these are the three differential length elements and for the differential area there's only one uh, differential area or area of concern for if you have a sphere so if you have a sphere there's only one area of the sphere. It's the surface area of the sphere. And the direction of the area vector, surface area vector of a sphere is 
along the Arhat direction. So along uh, this direction, the Arhat direction, the three-dimensional vector direction. So of course, if you integrate this differential area here, you will get the surface area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. So uh, theta ranges from 0 to pi, phi ranges from 0 to 2 pi. And if you get, and for the differential volume uh, in spherical coordinate system, then just multiply the three differential line elements, dr, rd theta, and r sin theta, d theta, d phi. And for a sphere, if you integrate this, you will get a value of 4 thirds pi r cubed, the volume of a sphere. So for our first example, for Coulomb's law in continuous charge distribution, we will have a line charge distribution. So our line charge here is distributed along the z-axis and we are asked to find the electric field at point P, which is a point in the x-axis. And we are to assume that the charge is distributed uniformly along the line. So this means that our lambda here is constant, meaning it's just equal to the total charge over the total length. Okay. So the formula is the Coulomb's law integral. So instead of k dq over r squared, instead of dq, we replace dq by lambda dl since this is a line charge uh, distribution. So since lambda is also constant, we can take it out of the integral. And since our differential length here is along the z-axis, our, our line charge is distributed along the z-axis, then dl is just dz. And we evaluate, we evaluate dz from negative l to positive l over the total length of the line. Okay. So... In order to evaluate this equation or this integral, we first need to know what is r, the separation distance, and r hat, the unit vector. So we first find a differential charge here with differential length dl, or in this case dz. So this differential charge <coughs> will have a position r prime. And our field point has a position of r, and this will be our uh, separation distance vector, curly r, which means our electric field will be along that direction, quadrant number 2, for this specific dq. So here, our, our prime is just along the z-axis, so z, z-hat. Uh, our field vector is along the x-axis, so x, x-hat. And the separation distance vector is just x, x-hat minus z, z -hat. Okay, so the magnitude of this by Pythagorean theorem, this is z, this is x, so therefore the hypotenuse is square root of x squared plus z squared. So we can now write our unit vector like this. So the separation distance vector, it divides a Yahan magnitude. Okay, now the electric field due to this differential charge will be in this direction. It will have two components, the x component and the z component. Now, there will be a corresponding differential charge in the opposite side here whose electric field will be in quadrant 1. And you will notice that their x components actually will cancel each other out by symmetry. And only, sorry, the z components will cancel each other out by symmetry. And only the x component will remain. So, you can make that argument to simplify your solution. You can say that by symmetry, only the x component of your r hat will contribute and the z component, the z hat component will not contribute. So instead of using r hat here in our equation, we can use, we can just use the r sub x or the x component, x x hat over this one. So, if we do that, 
what will happen now to our uh, equation? So let's substitute all of the all of the quantities or values. So we have lambda over four pi epsilon naught integral from negative l to positive l. We have dz over uh, r squared. So r is square root of x squared plus z squared. If you square that, it's just x squared plus z squared and then our r hat vector instead of using r hat you only use the x component because the z components will cancel each other out so you have x x hat over square root of x squared plus z squared so simplify this we are only integrating over z so x is a constant with respect to z we take it out of the integral we have 4 pi epsilon naught integral from negative L to L of dz over, you have x squared plus z squared, multiply by x squared plus z squared to the power of 1 half, so you will get x squared plus z squared to the power of 3 halves. Now, how do you integrate this uh, integral? So, you may have encountered this in your uh, mathematical co mathematics courses, differential equations courses. So, one technique, there are many techniques of integration. So, one is called trigonometric substitution. So, take note here, in our, we have a right triangle. Our right triangle... The length of our right triangle here is, this is the z-axis of z, this is x, and this is square root of x squared plus z squared. So if I let this angle as say alpha, then tangent of alpha is just, tangent is opposite of the angle over the adjacent. So z over x. Therefore, z is equal to x tangent alpha and dz is equal to x differential of the tangent is second squared alpha d alpha okay so from our integral here We can just first solve for the indefinite integral. So our in, our this integral here will just solve it indefinitely. We will not uh, evaluate at the limits first. So that integral will become integral dz, which is this one, x second squared alpha d alpha over uh, x squared plus z squared. This, this is our z now. If you square that, you will get x squared tangent squared alpha raised to the power of 3 halves. Okay. So, x is definitely not a function of alpha, so we can take it out of the integral. And then we are left with second squared alpha d alpha. Now, if we uh, factor out x squared here, we'll have 1 plus tangent squared alpha and this whole term here is raised to the power of 3 halves now this term here 1 plus tangent squared alpha is just the definition of second squared alpha so we have x squared raised to the power of 3 halves that will give you uh, x cubed so you have an x cubed in the denominator you have an x in the numerator so therefore out of the integral you will have uh, 1 over x squared and then <coughs> you have second squared alpha you have second squared alpha raised to the power of 3 halves that's second cube alpha so you have second alpha over second cube so you have 1 over second 
and then 1 over second is just the inverse of uh, cosine. So 1 over second is basically just cosine. So you will have cosine alpha d alpha. Sorry. So our integral simplifies to cosine alpha d alpha. Where in its integral, the integral of cosine alpha d alpha is just sine alpha. So we will have sine alpha and then 1 over x squared or over x squared. So essentially this integral here is just equivalent to uh, sine alpha over x squared. So you have 1 over x squared, you have x, so you will have lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught x, and then you have sine alpha. So this is just sine alpha over x squared, that integral. But we still need to evaluate alpha from negative L to positive L. So what is now our, what is sine alpha? So let's go back to our right triangle here. So what is sine alpha? From this right triangle here, sine alpha is just so opposite over hypotenuse. So the opposite of alpha is z and the hypotenuse is square root of x squared plus z squared. So meaning we have lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught x and sine alpha is actually just z over square root of x squared plus z squared and you evaluate this sine alpha from negative l to positive l okay so if you evaluate that at the upper limit you have l over x squared plus l squared then minus negative l over x squared plus negative l squared is still l squared so you will have l minus negative l which is just 2l so you will have lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught x then 2l over square root of x squared plus l squared so simplify sorry so there will be 2 left so you will have lambda l over 2 pi epsilon naught x square root of x squared plus l squared which is which should be our result. So lambda L over 2 pi epsilon naught x squared of x squared plus L squared. So I forgot, don't forget your direction x hat here. x hat, x hat, x hat, x hat. These are all x hat directions. Okay, so only the x component will survive or will remain or will contribute to the final uh, total electric field okay so this is now our result <clears throat> so follow-up question at points far away from the line charge that is your point P is very much uh, so at points are very far from your line charge so your X here is approaching infinity so which means x is very much larger than l so if x is very much larger than l what will your electric field look like from a very far point of view so your x squared plus l squared here will just be approximately x squared since x is very much larger th larger than L so in the square root the term square root of x squared plus L squared will just be square root of x squared or x and then you will get lambda L over 2 pi epsilon naught x and then the square root term will just become x so you have x squared x hat so, since the lambda here is uniform, it's just equal to the total charge, say, Q, over the total length. In this case, the total length is 2L. So it's from negative L to L. So, the total charge is just 
2 lambda L. So if I multiply 2 in the numerator and 2 in the denominator, and my 2 lambda L, this will be my Q, total charge Q, then my electric field will look like this. So 2 times 2, we have 4. So 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the total charge Q over X squared X sub. So what does this electric field look like? So this just looks like the electric field of a point charge where our x is our r. So kq over r squared r hat or x is our r since the x-axis in this problem is our field, uh, field vector, uh, field point uh, vector. So this is quite intuitive because if you look a line from a very far point of view, it will just look like a point. Actually, any charge distribution, if you view it from a very far point of view, it will just look like a point charge. So, all of your res results for different charge distributions, when viewed from infinity, will just a point will just approach to the electric field of a point charge. So what if it's the inverse or the reverse? What if your line now is very long as compared to your uh, field point distance, x? So L here is now very much larger than x. So if L is very large, then x is very, very small. Then the square root of x squared plus L squared will just be approximately square root of L squared or L. So there's an L in the numerator, L in the denominator that will cancel out, and you will get this expression. So lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught x. So this is the field of a line charge. So you actually have derived this expression before in your P641. So this is the field, electric field of a line charge, where x here can be is the perpendicular distance from the line. So in proper coordinate system, x should be s, the two-dimensional uh, radius, perpendicular distance. So this is s and this is s hat in co uh, cylindrical coordinate system. So let's have another example, which is surface charge distribution. And again, sigma here is a uniform surface charge density. It's a constant. So we use the same equation, but we replace uh, dq again by sigma dA. And since sigma is constant, we take it out of the integral. And our differential area here is since this is just uh, a circle of radius r, so we take the, differ the differential area s ds gp. So you go back to the uh, slide where we review the coordinate system. Okay. So we choose a differential charge dq, find its position, and then find also the position of the field point to get the separation distance uh, vector. So here r prime is uh, s s hat. Uh, take note that r prime, this is now, we must use cylindrical coordinates here because we have cylindrical symmetry. So even though this is the x-axis, but this is also the s hat axis. So actually, any axis that is radially outward is the s hat axis in cylindrical coordinates. So for instance, this axis in Cartesian, this is negative x axis, but in cylindrical coordinates, this is still the positive s hat axis. So this is s hat, that is s hat, this is also s hat. So our r prime here will be s, the, direct, the distance is s, and the direction is s, s hat radially outward, two-dimensional radius. Our R is, of course, along the z-axis, so z, z hat, so it's cylindrical coordinates, so therefore, that will be our separation distance vector. And by Pythagorean theorem, if this is S and this is uh, z, then the hypotenuse or the length of our separation distance vector will be square root of z squared plus s squared. And this will be our uh, unit vector for the separation distance. Now, similar with the previous uh, example, you can invoke 
symmetry. So because of symmetry, there will be a say another DQ in which the electric field components, the S components in this case of the electric fields will cancel each other out. So the S component of this one and the S component of this electric field will cancel each other out and only the Z component will remain. So you can invoke symmetry that only the Z component will contribute to the final total electric field. So that instead of using this one, R hat, you can yes, just use RZ or the Z component of R hat. So we no longer include the SS hat component. Okay. So in order to get uh, this result, we substitute our values. So we substitute our R, the magnitude of the separation distance vector, and the Z component of R hat to our equation here. So our electric field integral will be like this, sigma over 4 pi epsilon naught. The integral of S, dS, d phi over curly r squared so curly r squared of z squared plus s squared so you square that one it's just z squared plus s squared and then r hat but instead of using the z the r hat we since we invoke symmetry we can just use this the z component so the z component is just z z hat all over square root of z squared plus s squared Okay, so we need to simplify since we are only integrating uh, with respect to S and phi. Take note, uh, this is a double integral. This is an integral with respect to S and with respect to phi. So we take it, we take z out of the integral for pi epsilon naught. Then uh, we first integrate d phi. So since there are no phi's here, so the only in integrand of d phi or, or phi is just one and then integral of s ds over so similar with the previous problem this is just z squared plus s squared to the three halves okay so d phi is evaluated from zero to two pi so you will have a two pi here and S is evaluated from 0 to R, the radius of our circle. So since I have already shown you uh, the solution in the previous problem where we used trigonometric substitution, it's similar here. So for this uh, integral, you still, you still will use trigonometric substitution. So just follow the steps in the technique called trigonometric substitution so that your final answer will look like this. So I will just leave this to you so that uh, it will not be boring enough so that you can do it on your own. So show that you will get this from this uh, integral here. So use trigonometric substitution. Okay, so follow up question. So we can also write our answer like this. No? So, what if now, similar to the previous problem, we get the limiting cases? So, at points far away from the surface charge distribution, what will your electric field look like? So, of course, I've already introduce the idea to you that anything whether it's a line a surface or a volume if it's viewed from a very far point then it will look like a point it will look like a point charge so evidently or consequently 
your electric field should appro approach a point charge electric field. So how do you do this? So unlike in the previous example where there's only one term, our electric field here has now two terms. So if it has now two terms, we need to expand the second term, the z squared plus r squared to the negative one half term using binomial expansion. So in this case, z is very much larger than r, which means that for this term here, we can actually factor out z squared so we have z squared and then it becomes 1 plus r squared over z squared and this whole term here is to the power of negative one half so this becomes z squared to the power of negative one half is just 1 over z and then you will have uh, 1 plus r squared plus z squared to the power of negative one half. Now, the second term here, r squared over z squared, is a very small number since uh, z is very large, very large as compared to r. So we can invoke binomial expansion, which is just one plus x to the power of n is approximately one plus nx plus dot dot dot. So actually we just need to expand to our first few terms. So here, the assumption here, you can use binomial expansion if the assumption is x is very much less than 1, which is the case here. This is very small. This is very much less than 1. So using binomial expansion, the second term here will become like this. So 1 over z. So we expand only up to the first two terms, so 1, so negative 1 half, your n here is negative 1 half, so you have negative 1 half, so negative r squared over 2z squared. Okay, so it will become 1 over z minus r squared over 2z cubed. Okay, so the second term here is just 1 over z minus r squared over 2z cubed. So you have 1 over z minus this one. So the 1 over z will cancel out. And what you're left with, so minus negative, so it becomes a plus, plus r squared over 2z squared. So this term here in the bracket, square bracket, just becomes uh, this one, r squared over 2z cubed. So if you simplify that one, you multiply this one by sigma z over 2 epsilon naught, you will get so you have your e now will become sigma z over 2 epsilon naught and in the square bracket, what's left in the square bracket will be this one, r squared over 2z cubed. So this is z hat. So how do you convert this to the electric field of a point charge? So of course we use the total charge q. So since sigma is uniform or constant, so it's just equal to the total charge q, or say q total in this case, over the total area. So in this case, the total area is pi r squared. So therefore, the total charge is just equal to sigma pi r squared. So if I multiply pi in the numerator and pi in the denominator, and I invoke that pi r squared sigma is my total charge, then I will get uh, 1 over... 2 times 2, you have 4, and you already have a pi in the denominator, 4 pi epsilon naught, then q total over, you have z, and you have z cubed, so you have z squared, z hat. So essentially, k q over r squared. So in, in our case here, z is our r, our field point uh, vector. Okay. So that one. Okay. So for the second limiting case, what if now, 
what if your surface charge becomes infinite so the radius becomes infinitely large so r is very much greater than uh, z the distance from the from the surface charge so you will get this one so what we'll do to get this value is you need to exp again binomial expansion for this term but you need to factor out r squared here so that you can achieve the condition for the binomial expansion which is 1 plus x so if you, fa if you factor out r squared then you will have 1 plus z squared over r squared where z squared over r squared is your x it's very much less than 1 because z is very much less than r or r is very much less than z and then you expand up to the first uh, few terms so take note the key here is to expand only up to the first few terms so in the in this example we are only left with one term uh, but here you will expect that you will get three terms so you need to simplify it and use the condition the limiting condition so that you can achieve uh, arrived at this result so actually if you do it properly the result in the square bracket should just be equal to 1 over z so the result of this bracket here should just be equal to 1 over z such that if this is just 1 over z so you multiply that sigma z over 2 epsilon naught you will get this one Sig sigma over 2 epsilon naught the z will cancel out so this result is very inter interesting since you will notice that the electric field doesn't depend on position z its direction is on along z hat but its magnitude doesn't depend on z meaning your electric field is constant so actually if you have if you have a sheet of charge so for instance this is the side view or the perspective view of your sheet of charge so you have positive charges on a square surface the electric field of this charge distribution is actually uh, constant so meaning the distance between the electric field lines are the same it doesn't change so whether the field point is here or the field point is here or the field point is here or the field point is at infinity the value of your electric field is still the same sigma over 2 epsilon naught. so sigma is a constant epsilon naught is a constant so the electric field is constant no matter the distance from the sheet of charge okay let's have a volume expansion sorry volume charge distribution problem but i will no longer solve this because this is very tedious and i have a very long solution so you have a sphere of charge wherein a total charge q is uniformly distributed inside the sphere of radius r so you're asked to find the electric field at points inside when r is less than the radius or points outside when r is greater than the radius of the sphere so if you use coulomb's law you replace dq by rho dv since this is now a volume charge distribution and if constant and uh, rho and charge density then you take it out of the integral and you use the differential volume of uh, in spherical co spherical coordinates for that one so i will no, no longer be using but uh, solving this problem but if you are interested you can uh, see the solution in our reference textbook or even in uh, no, even in university physics uh, book this is solved this problem is solved in university physics book so you will get the electric field inside like this and the electric field outside like this but you must have realized in uh, in your physics 41 that Coulomb's law is advantageous if you use if you apply it in discrete charge distribution if you have a continuous charge distribution such as this and your distribution has a symmetry then it's easier to use Gauss's law so we can actually derive these uh, values and our examples the previous examples using Gauss law very much 
uh, easily. With uh, the, integra the integration will not be that uh, tedious. You don't need to use trigonometric substitution. It's just simple. Uh, Actually, in most cases, you don't need to integrate if you use Gauss's law. So that's the end of Coulomb's law for continuous charge distribution lesson. So for our next lesson, we will try to solve those problems again, the continuous charge distribution problems again. But now we use uh, Gauss's law, which is the more uh, advantageous uh, approach when dealing with symmetric charge distribution. So that's it for today's lesson. I hope you learned something and thank you for listening and I will see you next meeting.